So the last teaching gig I had before I left the newspaper business was teaching editors what was actually in the impact study. In fact, I would go do these workshops for regional chains and national chains, and I had people who would come up and say, well, I was one of the impact study papers, and I never understood what impact said. And that made me really worry, because nobody was paying attention to good research that was being done at Northwestern that showed that what brings people back to your news product is if you're looking after their personal and civic interests. That's good journalism. And so many editors went off point with the impact data and started doing things that served neither of those interests. So when I got to Stony Brook, one of the first things we do, immersion course in news literacy. First assignment, you may not consume any news for 48 hours. And most of these students, right, you all read the regression study by Marcher and Bartiromo in the early 1990s that said, we're losing those people anyway. So it was no surprise when they said to me, I can do that. I, don't, I do that every day. No, no, I say, you misunderstand me. If somebody turns on the TV and it's news, you have to leave the room. If somebody switches on the radio in the car and it's news, you have to change the channel. If somebody starts talking about a story from the newspaper, you have to leave the room. Oh, and by the way, you probably should stay off Facebook unless you've got a way to avoid discussion of news on Facebook. 48 hours. The students come back freaked out. So the first thing I realized, and with all due respect to Belden and Urban, most of the readership data that I spent tens of thousands of dollars on completely missed that fact. A lot of the data that panicked us and freaked us out was pretty sound, but it missed the fact that news is the grist of everyday life, even for teenagers. So what have we done at Stony Brook? Well, let me just do a little thought experiment. How many of you are ASNE member editors? Raise your hands. OK, so we have about 20 editors here. How many people are registered for this conference, Leanne? Any idea? OK, so here's what Stony Brook's doing. Um, this reminds me of NIA, which also died, which was about building future audience. News literacy is about building future audience. It's not our job to build your audience. But I will tell you the outcome of the news literacy course is that students who take the course compared to their peers consume a broader range of news outlets. They're better able to recognize poorly sourced stories and stories that lack evidence. They score higher on civic engagement tests, on civic, excuse me, basic civic knowledge tests than their peers. So like NIA, we're building audience for you, and 20 of you are here today. Just an observation. What can you do? Tell your fellow editors to support people who are supporting them by showing up to hear what's going on. So here's what Stony Brook's doing. We've taught this news literacy course to 10,000 undergraduates at Stony Brook, plus thanks to night funding, we've also shared the course in an open source uh, method with other universities. There are now 50 plus universities across the country that are using all or part of the Stony Brook model in an undergraduate course. We've trained teachers from 30 states, about 100 teachers from 30 states, who are teaching news literacy or parts of the news literacy course in <clears throat> about 100 classrooms around the country. The amazing thing in the last year is that this is not necessarily tied to democracy. We now have partnerships to build news literacy courses in Bhutan, mainland China, Hong Kong, Russia, Vietnam, Cambodia, and Myanmar. This question of citizenship in the digital era is a big deal globally. Big deal globally. Um, so one of the teaching tools we use is something called the News Literacy Channel on YouTube, where we collect video assets that are useful in the classroom, including long talks by journalists who come to Stony Brook to our lecture series, but that we also clip into pieces and parts for teachers to use in the classroom. 
and that's all open and available for free. I think there's 195 of those videos on the channel, last I checked. So every semester I put Bill Keller on trial. It's really fun. We share with students the details of the Swift case, not Swift Boat, but the wire transfer case. This is the story that the Times broke about the fact that we were monitoring uh, transactions, interbank transfers, to try and follow the money. We acquaint them with uh, the Washington Post's exposure of the torture prisons in non-Geneva Convention conforming countries. And then we ask students to answer the question that, sorry to say, my congressman asked, which is, shouldn't Bill Keller and his reporters be put on trial for treason and espionage? It's a great debate. And I'm pleased to say that most semesters, our students acquit Keller of the charges. But it's a great debate, and it leads me to the point that I want to leave you with, which is, what's an editor to do about news literacy? Catch up. Catch up because a lot of editors, and I know this because I was an editor, a lot of editors misunderstand the First Amendment. You are not. You are not the stewards of the First Amendment, and you were never intended to be. There was no press industry when the First Amendment was written. Literally, what is meant is my crazy uncle in his basement with a mimeograph machine. Right? It's, and, and that is the world in which we're now operating. I think it's why there's 20 editors here today, because really the audience is in charge in a huge measure, and now the audience is playing that function, that First Amendment function of watchdogging the other branches of government, right? This was the American experiment, was that an enormous range of rights and powers were reserved to the individual, and that's what the news literacy courses and projects that you're hearing about are focused on, is teaching people to fully inhabit that role, to fully inhabit that role. And this is a phrase we've used from the get-go in getting students engaged in this course. And it was really interesting to me to hear Arnie Duncan articulating that better than I've heard it articulated here. This idea that we want to make people full citizens, and they do it using their mobile device. They take the video right? They send out the dispatch. They haven't replaced you. But what we're trying to do in the news literacy movement is train them to do two things. One is to play that role, that First Amendment role, that fourth estate role, responsibly. But the other is to value the work of professional journalists, which is quantitatively and qualitatively better than citizen journalism. By any measure, it's better. But they're not going to appreciate that unless they're schooled in the kind of critical thinking skills by which they encounter a variety of reports, a tsunami of reports each day. And they say, wow, there is a difference between this and this and this. I misspoke this morning and blamed the Washington Post. But let me just think about the dystopia that we're dealing with. We, and I count myself as a, a brother editor to you. The dystopia that we've watched evolve, right? And it starts, this is the way I sort of run it. We start with the birther movement. How am I doing? Am I OK on time for a minute? You've got about a little bit left. A little bit left. Starts with the birther movement. <laughs> Right, which almost everybody in this room would get wrong. <laughs> it would, almost everybody would get wrong if I said who started it. It didn't start in the right wing. Where did it start? State of Maryland, lawsuit by a Hillary supporter trying to prove Barack Obama was not a legitimate citizen. It starts with that, and that thing has incredible valence, which causes a lot of us despair right off the bat. How can people believe this when it's been documented and redocumented and redocumented? And when you go on Google and you look up Martin Luther King and there's a million, uh, 300,000 web pages on Martin Luther King, but thank God, Google 
organizes that so it's usable, right? And the fifth one on the list, anytime you search, is a site run by a white supremacist organization devoted to tearing down Martin Luther King. Well, wait a minute. Rank is not equal to reliability? That's a key lesson of this course. It also should be a key lesson of every newsroom, teaching their readers that. So, and it, get, and it gets worse and worse. I mean, we watched a Playboy bunny become the leading advocate on vaccine policy to the extent that now childhood diseases that we wiped out are making a comeback in the United States of America. You know, you look at these developments and you think, oh my God, it's all lost. You know, the, the, the newsrooms have been weakened by this change in the business model and there's nobody standing up and putting out this information. But the fact is, it does make a difference. The fact is, there is a counter, and it is news literacy education. I'm not trying to make all my students journalists, and I'm not, certainly not a cheerleader for journalism. I can't do that. It would be irresponsible to do that. But I can make them critical thinkers. And to the extent that we use news as the text, of a critical thinking course. We have incredible impact on students. Really and truly what news literacy is, is a critical thinking course. And what we discovered, what Howie Schneider, a newspaper editor, discovered when he built the first course in 2006, was that the fresh daily news is the oxygen in the classroom. They are reading you. They're not paying you for it. That's your fault. They are reading you. They are paying attention to the news, and when you use that in the classroom, it rivets them in their seat in a way that other classes do not. It makes a huge difference. And so, you know, my last thing I want to say, what's an editor to do? Pay attention to the fact that this course, right, I ran off those numbers. Students who take the course versus their peers are 30% more likely to register and vote because they thought about critical thinking in a news context. There's something about the disciplines of journalism, of verification and skepticism, that when you train students to think that way, they do better at everything they do. So the question put to this panel, what's an editor to do? Well, here's the irony of working in news literacy. It's nearly impossible for us to get coverage of what we're doing. The most assiduous series of articles I've seen on our work at Stony Brook were produced two places. One, at the newspaper from which I was fired, where they did three columns on what we were doing last year. And the other is at the newspaper in Puerto Rico, in San Juan, Puerto Rico where the publisher there had breakfast with me while I was speaking at a conference, got really excited what we were doing, and looked at his editor and she said, I know, we're on it. And they've done like a series of five articles. Otherwise, in the, news, in the mainstream news industry, regarding what news literacy is doing in each of these communities, crickets. So what's an editor to do? Pay attention to what the news literacy movement is trying to do to save the idea of an informed, engaged electorate. Thank you. Thank you.